Hi everyone, uh, today I want to do something a little bit different than we usually do um, and talk about a GHC proposal that I've been hard at work on. Um, I just posted this to the repo tonight and um, uh, well, I, I think, you know, it's quite interesting. So I wanted to go through it a little bit and explain some of what's going on uh, behind this. So a link to the proposal and such will be in the in the description. Um, let's dive in. So. Um, this is really a, a a combination of a whole bunch of proposals. Actually, let me back up one 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 step. So many of you may know this, but some of you I'm sure uh, won't. Um, and that is that GHC evolves through a proposals process. So the Haskell language uh, was started sort of around 1990, and then it was a bunch of people working together to to create a lazy functional uh, programming language. And over time, that eventually became standardized as Haskell 98 and then updated again for Haskell 2010. During that phase of Haskell's existence, there were a number of Haskell compilers, and they were encouraged to experiment by adding language extensions. Um, as time has gone on, one compiler has sort of won out. There, there are still other Haskell uh, uh, compilers out there, but, but GHC is, of course, much more popular than, than all of the others. Um, and it became clear several years ago that we needed some way of adding new features to GHC in a, in a somewhat democratic way, right? Uh, over most of GHC's existence, those working on GHC would just say, hmm, it should have this feature, and then maybe discuss with their friends and then add it. Um, we wanted a more transparent, more inclusive process for this, um, and, and so created this GHC proposals process where anyone can think up a feature for GHC, write it up, propose it, and then we can all discuss it, and then a committee can decide whether or not this is the right thing for GHC. Um, recently, there's been a number of proposals around scoped type variables, and so many that it was a little hard to see the forest for the trees. Um, and so uh, the, there was a request to take a bunch of these proposals and combine them into one master proposal that covers it all. This is that master proposal. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to take the current scope type variables feature and update it to accommodate lots of the features that have been added to GHC since scope type variables. Um, luckily, this is done in almost completely a backward compatible way. Uh, I'll return to the backward incompatible part a, a little bit later. Um, what I find interesting about the way that this proposal developed is, as I'm starting to scroll down here, so, so first we, we see here, um, this is, is clobbering how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven previous proposals all rolled into this one. So some of these have actually already been accepted. Others of these are actually are amendments to ones that have been accepted. But you can see that there's this zoo, um, and it would be nice to just have one document that covers this whole topic. And, and, and so this is that document. And uh, as I was starting to say, one of the interesting things here is that I wanted to start this by thinking about the principles behind scope type variables. What goals am I trying to achieve through this design? And by stating these up front, we can then check later, are we meeting those goals? Is this design, does it meet the goals that we want to meet? Um, and so that's, I think, one of the more interesting parts of this proposal is that there's a new section, not part of most proposals, called principles. Um, and so let's go through these principles of this proposal. Uh, the first is the lexical scoping principle right up here. For every occurrence of an identifier, it is possible to uniquely identify its binding site without involving the type system. So what this is is saying that um, if I see an X somewhere in my code, I can figure out where X was bound without actually having to do any type inference first. Um, most of the time, that's fairly easy to do, um, but sometimes it can get a little squirrely, especially around dependent types. So this particular principle is taken from another proposal, which is all about dependent types. It turns out that the, it's not the lexical scoping principle that's so interesting for this current proposal, but what I call the lexical scoping principle corollary, which says that when we see an identifier in a program, when we see the, the you know X, Y, Z in a program, we have to know whether it is a binding site, where this is where we introduce XYZ, or an occurrence, where we're referring to some XYZ that has already been bound elsewhere. And we have to be able to do this without involving the type system. Um, 
One of the reasons I don't want to involve the type system is I want to be able to just look at a Haskell program and understand the relationships between binders and occurrences. If I have a bunch of variables all named XYZ floating about, I should be able to figure out which XYZ refers to which definition of XYZ without doing type inference, because that's really hard to do type inference as I'm reading a program. And, um, and I would like to be able to, to understand this relationship without doing that type inference. So that's, that's LSPC. The syntactic unification principle is this. In the absence of punning, um, uh, punning isn't really defined here. Punning is when we use the same name for a term level variable as a type level variable. Um, in the absence of that, there is no difference between type syntax and term syntax. So this also is more motivated by dependent types, but it comes into play here, right? I want my language not to really care so much, am I in types or am I in terms? Uh, because eventually, I personally want there to be no difference at all between these type th these syntaxes. Um, so now we go into a new principle, what I call the explicit variable principle. So this basically says that anytime I have a thing, I can write its type, which sounds easy enough, but this is actually not true in Haskell 98. If I have a function, a polymorphic function with a helper, then sometimes if that helper function needs to refer to a, a variable bound in the type of the outer function, I, there's no way of doing that because Haskell 98 and Haskell 2010 don't include any scoped type variable mechanism. Um, so this explicit variable principle says that basically anywhere I want to, I can write the type of a thing. Anywhere I want to, I can write a type application for a thing. Um, and it turns out that there's quite a lot of work that's needed to support this because I need to be able to bind all kinds of different variables. So here in const, um, uh, this, is, this is just the function const, but over here, I wanna be able to write what is, what is the type of x? Well, it's gotta be a, but in order to be able to write a here, I need some mechanism that brings this a in scope over here. To be able to write the type of b, or the type of Y rather, I need some mechanism that brings this B in scope over here. So Haskell 98 already violates this just for const. In here, when I have an existential, now this existential, I've bound this variable X. Well, what is X's type? Well, it's this A here, but it's a specific one that's tied to this existential. So I need to have some way of binding that over here in order to support the EVP. In a higher rank type, this HR in its argument brings into scope a type variable A. I need to be able to refer to that here if I want to talk about the type of X or of Y. Um, and so uh, having this EVP forces us to invent new features that allows us to bind these type variables. This EVP is not true in Haskell today. Const we can handle through scope type variables. Um, and this, there's a recent feature in GHC that allows us to bind a, a type variable here, but there is currently no way of binding a variable here, uh, well, without using pattern bindings. But in some cases, pattern bindings just don't work. Um, uh, there are uh, examples linked to from this, this proposal that show, that show how that is. Um, so that's the EVP. The explicit binding principle, it, it sort of sounds like the explicit variable principle, but, but this is a different thing. This says that every now and then, Haskell is going to bring something into scope sort of automatically. Uh, this happens here in the type of id. This a, there's no specific spot that a is brought into scope. Instead, GHC notices that a isn't in scope and brings it into one, brings it into scope. Um, here, this b is sort of brought into scope by matching. Um, and I don't want to have to do that. I want every variable to, have, to be able to just sort of say um, where it's bound and, and sort of that's its full description. Um, and so this is the explicit binding principle. The reason it's important is maybe some programmers want to always be very, very, very explicit about where they're bringing things into scope. Um, and, and maybe we not everyone wants to do that, and that's fine. We're never going to force that. This ID has type AROA. We're always going to continue to support that. Um, but maybe some programmers want to always be super explicit. And so the explicit binding principle says that through the right combination of extensions and or warning flags, like turning on W error, it is possible for a Haskell programmer to ensure that all identifiers in a program have an explicit written binding site. Um, so, so that's a very nice principle if we want to be really pedantic in our code. Um, next, we have the visibility orthogonality principle. 
which says that if something is visible versus invisible, it really shouldn't matter other than its visibility. So uh, Haskell is, is cur we're, we're currently in the process of approving this syntax. This is uh, proposal number 281. Um, here, this for all A, we're going to, we're going to require that we write um, uh, uh, the type that is passed to F1 when, whenever we're calling or defining F1. This is a type here, A, so it's going to be something like int or bool, um, but we're going to be required to pass it when we call F1. Here, it's our usual for all a dot, where we're not required to pass it, but maybe we want to anyway. And the visibility orthogonality principle says that in these cases, all that matters is down here I have an at, uh, an at sign, and up here I leave it out. But otherwise, my scoping and other effects are unchanged between these two. Um, and, and so it turns out that this can sometimes be hard to uphold. We don't really have this syntax very much. And so this is, it's not really, um, uh, it's not very relevant to ask, do we have this property today? Um, the last principle I outline here is the pattern expression duality principle, which is that, well, patterns should look like expressions, but right? we don't have wildly different pattern syntax than we do for expression syntax, or they're not really patterns. Um, and so it turns out that this is sometimes hard to uphold. This is true today, um, but it's, it's in threat by various other features. And so designing to keep this principle was a little bit hard in places. So then the proposal goes on to actually say what the changes are. This universals and existentials, this is a bunch of, of useful background material, but we're going to skip over this for now and instead look at the, the proposed changes rather briefly. Uh, the point here is, is more to sort of introduce the philosophy here than get into the nitty gritty of exactly how this is going to work. You can read the proposal for that nitty gritty. Um, so the first is to break up the existing scoped type variables behavior into smaller pieces so that they can be turned on and off uh, independently. This helps support this explicit binding principle where we might want to disable some of the more implicit features that come with today's scope type variables. Um, and so here, all of these are, are broken out um, in, into individual pieces. Scope type variables remains, and it implies a bunch of other extensions, so it's going to keep its same meaning as today. Um, a new one here is this new extension, Im implicit for all. Implicit for all um, is going to be enabled by default, and that's what enables this ID colon colon ARO A behavior. Um, and so this automatically brings variables into scope if they aren't. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of examples of exactly where that happens. Uh, the next part of the proposal changes GADT syntax to distinguish better between universals and existentials. The, the motivation for this is a little technical. I'm not going to get into that right now. But the change is that in a GADT, so here's an example that just happens to be on the screen. Right now, this A does not scope over the body. So this A and this A are completely unrelated. Um, and this causes some strangeness. What I would like to do in this proposal is to actually say that this A does scope over all of the constructors, meaning that this A will just be an occurrence of, of that A up here, and that cleans up both kind inference and detection of universals and existentials. Um, I believe that this change should be backward compatible. Um, okay, let's move on. Moving on, where can we move on to? Ah, type arguments and constructor patterns. So this is actually already accepted and implemented, but I wanted to incorporate it in with all of these other moving pieces. Um, and this is slightly different than what's accepted today and implemented today in that it's called type abstractions, which doesn't exist today, but it seemed a, a better fit in this, in this new proposal. And the idea here is, let's see, I hope we have some examples. So, um, the, the, the idea here is that now I can bind a variable here that, say, relates to an existential. So now I can talk about the type of Z in the right-hand side of F2. Um, and, and so that's a really nice feature. Uh, that, that's sort of the big thing that this gives us, is it allows us to write these at patterns. Uh, not, they're not really at patterns. These type arguments to constructors in, um, in patterns. Uh, so that's, that's very useful. Uh, let's see. Next is type arguments in lambda patterns. So the first one was in constructor patterns after some constructor. We also maybe want to do this in a lambda, and this is useful in higher rank scenarios. Um, so this is a little bit harder to pull off. There's some technical exposition here of exactly how we do it. 
um, but it should be fairly straightforward in practice. Um, moving on, let's see. Um, oh, and there's some bad interaction with today's scope type variables here that is detailed in the proposal. I don't want to get into that right now. Um, so next, I'm, I'm quite excited about this. This sort of fits in with this explicit variable principle, um, is to be able to let bind types. So normally we can just say let over terms. If I say let x equals, well, x has to be a term. Now I can say, uh, let's see, do we have examples? Oh, I don't even write any examples. I should have written some examples. Um, so here, instead of just normal declarations, I can now write type in a local declaration. I can say let type x equals something, and then an x is going to be a type variable that stands for some fully, fully, fully written out type. This is, uh, this is going to be quite useful, I think. Um, I also want let in patterns. So let's see. So here I have some examples. So here I can now bring something into scope in a pattern that scopes over the rest of that pattern. Um, so the syntax here was a little bit of a compromise because it looks like this type b equals bool should only be in scope here in x, but actually I want it in scope for the entire scope of the pattern. So it's going to be scoped here because anything brought into scope by this part of the match is, is also in scope here. And it's also actually going to be in scope over here. Um, but this is, this is convenient both for bringing types into scope and also in view patterns. So it's a bit obscure, but it's a, it's a way, sort of a nice little syntactic trick that gives us this explicit binding principle. Um, also, mostly because we can, and this is a convenient place to do it, uh, this proposal introduces let in types. So now, instead of just being able to say let in terms, I can write let in types like this. So we can bring some stuff into scope with a for all. And now I can just say let C equals something big, and then I can use C multiple times in my type. This just seems like a nice addition, a nice thing to have. Um, and so, and then at the end, I go back and show that all of these different principles laid out, laid out at the top of the proposal are actually upheld by this, by this design. And so we can see that this particular design works for these principles. Um, maybe we'll identify other principles that aren't upheld, or maybe, maybe there's a bug, maybe I've made a mistake somewhere, but I'm hoping that this presentation allows us to evaluate the specific designs against some kind of standard. Um, my hope is perhaps if this proves successful that we can take these principles and start to codify them, maybe put them and sort of give them some life of their own and say, here are the principles of Haskell that future proposals should aspire to. Um, anyway, uh, again, the link to this is in the description. I'd be happy for your feedback on the proposal uh, if you've got it. Um, thanks very much for watching. Hope this has been interesting. So long.